your public health professional and you coming to you courtesy of the Maryland Public Health Association. For one, we have a new website. And this gives us an opportunity to let our members and members of the public like yourself learn more about the organization. So it's mdpha.org. But we have put up a user-friendly website where you can go and learn more about who we are, learn about public health itself, learn about advocacy, the events we are hosting out in the community, and how you can join us. Very important. We're also going to be sharing, guess what, public health news, and you can read our bi-weekly updates also on the website. Hello. I am Lillian Agbeyegbe, your friendly community health educator. I'm excited to welcome you to another episode of Your Public Health Professional and You, coming to you from the Maryland Public Health Association. Good day and happy holidays to you. I have a special guest today, and guess what? You're going to get two for the price of one. Why do I say that? Well, because our special guest is going to talk to us about her public health profession, but she is also the outgoing president of the Maryland Public Health Association. So we get to do a deeper dive into the association and about the association today. Jody Gann, it's my pleasure to welcome you to your public health professional on you. Thank you, Lillian. Great, Jody. So let's get to meet you. We know Jody Gann is a public health professional. Tell us, who are you and what do you do as a public health practitioner? Sure. Um, well, it's so nice to be here and I'm excited to talk about my role um, with the Maryland Public Health Association, but also to tell you what I do when I'm not <laughs> working with our wonderful um, association. And so I am a full-time faculty member um, at American University in the Department of Health Studies, where I have the honor of teaching undergraduates in our public health program. So I teach all sorts of introductory public health courses, uh, health promotion, program planning. And one of my biggest joys is um, I supervise our students when they do their internships in the field. And um, yeah, so that's, and I've been there about 10 years. And before that, I was, you know, like you said, a practitioner in the field. And um, so now it's very fun to kind of have this more academic side of my public health journey, but where I get to teach the tools of the trade and things that I did from the, gosh, couple of decades that I, you know, worked in our wonderful field. Awesome. That is so great. And 10 years in the profession um, has given you time to see the what I'll call the rewards of your labor, as it were, people who have come through your program. And um, public health is a very diverse field. If you're teaching people coming in, some people have gone on to be epidemiologists, some people have gone on to be biostatisticians, and some people have gone on to be nutritionists. There's some of your previous students that are doing particular work in the field of public health that you might be interested in highlighting. Oh my gosh, that is such a great question. Um, well, I just finished writing a slew of recommendations for graduate work for students, most of who are going on to get a master's in public health. And so that's exciting. Um, and one of the things that I think is really thrilling is when I go to conferences like the American Public Health Association um, annual conference, where I just was in Boston in November, and I see my former students, um, you know, passing through the halls of the conference, but also at their presentations. It is just, in, it makes me incredibly proud. Um, so what are some of my students doing? You know, I look on LinkedIn just to kind of see what they're up to. And just like what you said, many of them are epidemiologists. I have students who are at the CDC um, and that that's incredible. I have students who are involved in local government and their local health departments. 
um, working for really interesting nonprofits. A lot of our students stay in Washington, D.C. That's where American University is, but a lot go back to their home communities. We have a fair number of students from abroad. Mm -hmm. Um, We have students from China. We have students, you know, and so it's kind of exciting to see what they do with their degrees. I'm always fascinated too with students who do more entrepreneurial mm-hmm. things and not so much the traditional um, things that you expect out of public mm-hmm. health. But um, yeah, like in 10 years, you know, students are are grown up now and, mm-hmm. and making some really wonderful contributions to the field. Great. And it's good that you um, have a class and you're teaching students because people always wonder about getting into public health you know, the the profession, do they have to have a specific kind of background? Do you see people coming? You talked about international students, for instance. Do you see people come to your class from different places, people who come straight from college or people who have been working and want to divert and coming into the profession? Is there a standard way in which people come into public health? Well, so my experience since I teach undergraduates Mm -hmm. is Oh. Yes, people are coming right, you know, from high school. Mm-hmm. But I will say that many of them have not, you know, don't really haven't really heard of public health. The pandemic has helped to put public health on the map and to heighten people's understanding. But I would say we have a lot of students that come in kind of like as pre-med mm-hmm. and then they just, you know, and they're thinking maybe there'll be a biology ma- major or something like that. And then they take one of our classes and they're like, wow, I'm, I'm going to do this. Even if I continue to be pre-med, mm-hmm. I want to get this kind of population level view of health before I start my clinical career. So in addition to helping students go on to graduate work in public health, I would say there's some that are going on to become, you know, doctors, nurses. I have a, quite a few students, you know, nurses, PAs, mm-hmm. physical therapists, but they're really happy that they had this chance to look at, you know, a wider view of health care that they get with their public health um, undergraduate preparation. Yes, and it's very important that intersection between medical health and public health. We saw a lot of that during the pandemic, you know, trying to take advantage of both the differences in both fields and looking out for the public good. But let's let's talk a little bit about the Maryland Public Health Association. You are the outgoing president of the Maryland Public Health Association. If you look at the Maryland Public Health Association that you came into as president and the one that you're leaving, um, what would you say is the difference? What have you accomplished during your tenure? Oh, wow. Well, it's kind of, so I've been with the association for like probably six or seven years, I think since 2016. So what did mm-hmm. Whatever, so maybe probably more than seven. Um, and uh, let's see. So I think that some of the things that I think the association really sh- shined, uh, some of the shining aspects before I was at the leadership were, you know, the advocacy work I think was really incredible. And some of my predecessors really put an emphasis on mm-hmm. advocacy. And as a result, um, you know, we are looked to with some really nice authority in this state and we're asked to partner and collaborate and as a result, get some really good legislative victories, which are so good for the state. Um, personally, I like to program. I'm more involved. I like um, planning programs opportunities to network. And I really like the professional association side, the fact that, you know, what we do for the people in our association to make them feel connected and proud of the field. Um, So I'm extremely proud of the annual meeting that we just had and the one that we had the year before that was on Zoom that I think, you know, we did the best that we could and still managed, I think, to be effective and bringing people together and bringing good speakers um, and making really making people feel connected. Um, I think what I'm proudest of is though our website. I was concerned that, you know, we're all volunteers and, um, you know, we just kind of do the best that we can. And so I'm really proud now that we were able to do this website revamp. We had some funding, we hired some amazing web designers, and then just internally, we worked really hard to make sure that our website 
reflected the vibrancy of our organization and the work that we're doing. So um, I, that was my number one priority. And Mm -hmm. we, we, I think we went live in November with our new, with our new website. So I'm pretty happy about that. And then um, we just have had a tremendous year in terms of bringing in grants. Okay. It's the grant funding that Mm -hmm. enables us to do things like revamp our website and kind of work on our infrastructure. And one of our grants um, from the Energy Foundation was a very sizable grant and it enabled us to hire a part-time staff member. And for an organization that's all volunteer led, and we all have really full, (laughs) full jobs and you know, family responsibilities and things like that. And so having this grant money enabled us to hire a part-time staff member to both coordinate our grant, but also help us administratively. And that's Allie Berry. Mm -hmm. And so we have somebody who's actually getting paid so we can, um, you know, really kind of ask to get some things done. And as a result, that that's just made such a difference um, in kind of helping us fill in some of the cracks. It is, it is so much that you said in such a short time, you know, mm-hmm. the advocacy work, making a difference in what's happening in Maryland. I'm working on the programmatic component of it. The annual meeting, your annual meeting, you had um, is award was given, your presidential award was given to Jimmy Rasking, who's who was, this is my county, and doing phenomenal work, you know, for the work that he's doing. But there was something that you also said during the annual meeting, because I was there and talked about how we've increased the numbers of new people who joined the association. Um, and tell me, because it, it not a lot of people join the association, but there's, there's what's the incentive, you know, because I, I can imagine that we have NIH close by, we have all of these places in DC and the tri-state area, and people are public health practitioners and they're like, um, do I want to join MDPHA or maybe they're in APHA and they think that that's enough. What's the difference between being in APHA, being in MDPHA, and what's the attraction for professionals to come on board? Okay, well, another great question. So let's see. Um, well, one of the, first of all, it's great if you are able to be part of both organizations. That's wonderful. Um, for some people, though, the dues for to join the American Public Health Association are very expensive. I have to be honest, I um, was, you know, some years I would be a member and some years I wouldn't because of the dues. And one of the nice things about working for the university is that I can get my professional dues to that association paid for. And that helps. Mm-hmm. But, um, we are very happy that we can keep the dues so much lower at the state level. Our, we In the years that I've worked at the association, we have not raised the dues. In fact, we've actually lowered them and made more membership categories to make them more accessible. But for $50 a year to be part of a professional association um, is not a lot to pay. And some of the value in that is um, one of the other things that I'm really proud of that we started is we have a biweekly email blast now. We used to do more like quarterly newsletters, and sometimes those would stretch to biannual <laughs> newsletters. And now every other week, our active members get a newsy email in their inbox with um, information about activities going on within MDPHA, but also we share all sorts of things that APHA is doing so that our members that aren't members of APHA will be in the know. We also, you know, if we hear about grant funding or jobs um, or if there's just really interesting state developments, there have been a lot, you know, and with COVID and everything, we want to make sure our members know. So I think getting the biweekly uh, news blast is a benefit. Being able to come to our annual meeting, um, we have networking opportunities. We like to do that in the summer. Um, we had a great summer networking um, meeting at Mirancho, rec- a Mexican restaurant in Silver Spring. Um, And then one of the things that I didn't mention before that's also one of my accomplishments that I feel good about is our relationship with the um, forming a a collaboration with the Pennsylvania Public Health Association and the Delaware Public Health Association. And together, we've done some really wonderful things in the region, including co-hosting a very robust 
conference in the spring. And it just, for economies of scale, I just think it makes a lot of sense to work with our partners to bring in great speakers to get a bigger critical mass. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's something too that our members get, you know, a discount coming to that. So they sort of have two opportunities for conferences and meetings where there'll be professional development and things like that. And then um, networking and then uh, members can just connect with other people through committee work. Um, we're always looking for people to participate. You know, we have people in our organization that have health communication skills. They should join our communications committee. Um, people who like to plan programs. Most of us have those skills from our training should join the program committee. And then, of course, the advocacy committee. Um, and, you know, that's that's our biggest committee. Um Advocacy. I tell you, one of the things I like about being um, in in MDPHA is, you know, as a public health practitioner, you sort of like are in one field and one track and you have your full time job and you're doing that. But when you join the association, you get the opportunity to hear what people are doing in other places and talking about the biweekly newsletter, for instance, you get to keep up with APHA, the Tri-State Area Collaborative. You get to hear what your colleagues are across the borders are doing. And then even in the state, you know, so you can get an opportunity to advocate for a bill. I might not be directly in what the area you're working in. But it's something that you're interested in because we're looking out for the public health of members of our community. And, and I think it was really very important to talk about how affordable it is to join the, the Maryland Public Health Association. Well said. I really like I think your point is is good about how, that it helps us enrich our skills in other areas that we don't always utilize in our in our jobs. So, Mm -hmm. you know, for some of us, like I said, I do a lot of program stuff in my job. And so that comes naturally, but then being exposed like to the advocacy committee, I'm learning a lot. And then I bring those skills in my classroom. I've added units in my intro to health promotion class on advocacy. Um, Yeah. So I, I, I think that's, that's absolutely right. We, you know, get to learn from each other and beef up skills that we don't use that much. And then we find ourselves incorporating those skills in our in our jobs too. So so yes, there's lots of benefits. <laughs> Great, yes. And, and then, so let's talk about your public health professional and you, and primarily because of COVID. COVID really sort of like brought the public health professional into the public eye. A uh, lot of people in public are like, um, I don't know what you do. I don't know how that has in, anything to do with me. And um, what would you say to the person who's like on the street, maybe your neighbor who says, well, you're a public health professional, but I'm a public. What 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 is what you're doing? What has it got to do with me? Why should I care about you or why why does your work influence me? Yeah, I think if you're just telling somebody what public health is, and you're right, a lot of people don't don't really understand. I think it's helpful to explain how public health is different from like individual medical care as a start. So everybody's familiar with individual health care, health care that we receive from a doctor just just for us. And I would say public health makes it so everybody has access to individual health care because the person on the street might have access to a doctor whenever they want, but that's not the case for, for everybody. So a very big part of public health is um, expanding medical services, making sure that the systems are in place for robust programs like government sponsored programs like Medicaid that cover people that might not have access to health health care. And then the biggest part of health of public health is making it so people don't need to rely on their doctors so much and have that don't have the need for individual health care because there are so many great systems in place to live a pretty healthy life. So, Mm -hmm. you know, we talk a lot right now on environmental health, uh, about environmental health, and that's something that Maryland Public Health Association is super interested in. So making sure that, you know, we have access to clean water and clean air so that we don't get you know, respiratory diseases and infections that require expensive medical care, and then just all sorts of preventive health care services that we have communities that we can exercise safely and get 
good physical activity, that we have sidewalks, that we have street lights, that we have speed limits so that <laughs> we don't get run down by a car when we're trying just to get, you know, get some, exactly. get some exercise and that we have, you know, access to healthy and affordable care, mm -hmm. uh, food. I meant to say food. Mm -hmm. um, those are all parts that, you know, the invisible parts of healthcare that people take for granted, I would say that's what I would say to the neighbor down the street that doesn't really understand what kind of things we work for in public health. Absolutely. I'm, I'm always very eager to share with them that you meet us every day. You just don't know it's us. You know, we're the people, we're the people who make sure that there's speed limits, like you said. And so if you're driving safely, has something to do with some public health practitioners somewhere. You know, one of the reasons why you wear seatbelts, so you say it's safe for you to wear a seatbelt, some public health practitioners somewhere is advocated for you. You go to the store and you're looking at nutritional facts on your on your products in the, in the store. Some public health professional professional has said, you know, this is mm -hmm. necessary, you know, um, saying you don't supersize your soda and you're driving, you're putting your baby in the car seat. You're encountering your public health professional all over the place. You're leaving, you go somewhere and it's a smoke-free facility, you know, and that's public health right over there, you know, but people are like, um, I don't know these people. Why are they telling me what to do now? But they actually sort of tell you what to do a lot of the time. Right. And sort of make the healthy choice the easier choice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even people who have knowledge about how to live a healthy lifestyle, sometimes that's not very accessible. And I think people in public health are always working to make it so it like I just said, so like the healthy choice is the easy choice doesn't require second thoughts. Um, and yeah, it's subtle. Public When public health works well, it's just behind the scenes. But unfortunately, people take it for, for granted. And, you know, more funding is allocated towards medical services than for, um, you know, creating healthy environments and really addressing, you know, in public health, we understand the root causes. What mm -hmm. are the the, the things that contribute to making people sick and unwell. So great. Thank you so much, Judy. It's been great talking to you. And before we go on, I'd just like you to give three messages to three groups of people. And um, one group of people are people who, you know, don't know, is public health a profession for me? Should I go into it? And um, what do you think if somebody is trying to think about, should I consider public health? Will it be a stretch? What would you say to such a person? The thing that I love about uh, a degree in public health is how versatile it is. So I, you know, where I am in my career, in my age, I have a lot of friends that aren't in public health and, you know, they've worked in their fields for like 10 or 20 years and they get bored. So they go back to school and they get a different degree and they kind of start over. And I think the nice thing about a public health degree is because it's so versatile, all the things that we've been talking about today um, that comprise public health, um, once you have this education and this training, you I've moved around so many different fields. I've worked in tobacco control. I've worked in HIV AIDS. I've worked on, you know, the Affordable Care Act. I've worked on sort of whatever the issue du jour is, whatever mm -hmm. our most pressing concerns. I feel like in public health, you you can you can move. You don't have to be stuck in um, one area for forever. You just kind of move to where where the needs are, where the funding is, and so that's why I think it it it's a very practical degree mm -hmm. and one that keeps you kind of stimulated and engaged throughout your your career, not feeling like you've hit a dead end. I've never felt that way. Awesome. I'm glad to hear that because I'm, my next question is to the public health professional about the work-life balance. So you said you've never felt that way. And you've also said, you know, um, the association was more, mainly manned by volunteers before. So what do you, what do, you do for work-life balance? And what would you say to the public health professional to make sure that they're doing for work-life balance? Well, we have to practice what we preach. <laughs> so, I mean, I think I got into public health uh, as a young person, just because I got interested in wellness and health promotion and things like that and on an individual basis. So I've just sort of been able, I've just realized how 
you know, good and energetic. I feel when I exercise, when I, when I eat well, when I'm able to like all the latest research shows that when you give back to your community, um, when you get involved in community service, you actually, it helps you manage your own stress and helps your own happiness. So I think practicing what we preach and making sure that, you know, our days include time to do these types of activities is really, really important in terms of work-life balance. Um, well, I know I'll share a fun fact, and that is that my son, my older son, who's 28, has his master's in public health. And he awesome. went in, into this field. And then my younger son is kind of doing what my my husband does. My husband's a lawyer. My son's in law school. And we said to our kids, we said like, hey, you guys, you don't have to do what we do. Like, please don't feel like you have mm-hmm, to. Mm-hmm. And I can't remember what I think it was my older son. He said the nicest thing. He said, well, you guys work really hard and do some really amazing things, but you also, you you seem to have good work-life balance. You also have rich personal lives. And I was like, oh my gosh, that is such a nice thing to say. And that, that to me was very satisfying to hear. So, um, you know, I think you just have to sort of get your priorities. And um, I think we, you know, I think Work hard and play hard. <laughs> Work hard and play hard. That's a good one. We always get all this good. That's that's a tweet right there, right? <laughs> Work hard and play hard. A public health professional. And great. Um, Chadi, so any last words? We've already said that the public health professional, you're in the tri-state area. Um, you want to join the Maryland Public Health Association, go to our website, www mdpha.org. It's a lovely website. It's um, user-friendly and easy to navigate. Doesn't cost much to join. $50, you can join and you can find an area of interest. You can be in the advocacy subcommittee. You can be in the communication subcommittee. There's a student wing. There's an environmental group. Did I cover everything? Uh, yes, if getting involved in our climate change and health activities. And then um, I, you said I could have a last word. I want to say mm-hmm. that we, with our new president, um, Suparna Navali, we, I know kind of my platform was like the website and communications and getting the, the biweekly news blast. And hers is expanding. I hear my dog has joined us today. Yes. Um, Hi. <laughs> she is very excited to expand our student section and actually has already been working to um, develop chapters of MDPHA on various uh, campuses across Maryland. We have so many um, programs preparing our students to enter our field. And so that's that's exciting too. So the student rate to join is only $25. And we are some of our um, campus leaders, uh, like deans and department heads are actually purchasing memberships for their incoming students, which we just think is such a fantastic thing. So we want to really encourage our students. We have internships. We um, have capstone projects for, um, we have our American University students have worked as, uh, you know, they've helped us with our National Public Health Week as their capstone project. So there's lots and lots of opportunities for students to get involved. And it looks great on students to have this work with our association on their resume to show that they're part of the public health community already. So I would really encourage that in the coming year. We'd love to see our students get engaged. I think that's really exciting. I remember when I was in my master's program and there was almost no class that we didn't have a group assignment. And then I didn't really know it, but it's like in the public health field, there's a lot of collaboration work. And so they were prepping us from the program. It's like you have to learn to work with other people. There was actually one class where the professor said, don't plan your meetings for before class or after class, because that's very convenient. Everybody's going to be on campus. And so you plan your meeting for before. She was like, plan your meetings for weekend off campus. And so we all had to agree on a time and on a date. And she's like, that's what the real world is about. You're going to be collaborating with other partners. You're going to have to do all of this concession give and take. And Mm -hmm. it's not going to be convenient for you all the time. 
coming to school and before class and after school is kind of convenient, but learn about, you know, the inconvenience, the give and take, looking at the, you know, bigger picture. And so it's really very exciting that Soprano is going to be focusing on students. I think that's a reality of what they will find in the world when they graduate and begin to interact with other professionals about all this collaborative work and the intersections between education, advocacy, the environment, and all of the different sectors of public health. Yeah, the students have a very big presence at the American Public Health Association. The student mm -hmm. section is very strong, and Suparna comes from that world. Um, so, it, it, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's going to be a great year. I know. <laughs> and on that note, 2023, oh, my goodness, the next time I come to you, it will be 2023 already. You know, but we're so very excited about how far we have come. Again, my name is Lilian Agwegwe. I'm your friendly community health educator. I've had the pleasure of talking to Judy Gann, our outgoing president from the Maryland Public Health Association. The Maryland Public Health Association is here um, for public health practitioners in the tri-state area. We welcome you. Join us. Bring your ideas. Bring your skills. Bring your experience. Let's get to know you. And we will also share information from APHA, from the tri-state area, if you are not a member of those, you can get all of that from our bi-weekly newsletter. So you want to join us, you want to stay connected, and we want to make sure that we're working together to keep Marylanders safe. Jody, any last words before we sign up? Just thank you, Lillian, and thank you for, um, you know, for starting this cool series. And I look forward to hearing from your guests next year as well. So thank you for doing this for us. It's a nice new edition. Awesome. Thank you very much. And we'll see you all next year. Um, remember, stay healthy until that. Don't eat too much. And if you do, make sure you're exercising as well. <laughs> look forward to seeing you in shape and on time. A happy new year in the coming. Bye. Happy new year. Thank you. Bye.